，喂喂喂，再小一点，再小一点。Good evening.、Um, first of all, thank you for coming.、Um, a little bit of a stressful night, a little bit of a stressful week.、Um, it's a crowded event. These guys are.、Uh, there's obviously lots of interest in、uh, in in family feud or、uh, dynastic feud or. Or some I don't know what the game show、uh, Alan's got lined up for us tonight, but、uh, we're we're soon we're soon to find out.、Uh, I only want to say we got a lot of people on the wait list, so、um, could we get people to sit close together and、uh, meet your neighbors?、Um, okay,、uh, and I just want to do a real quick count, and then I'll see how many additional people will let in. Okay. And for those of you who have like stuff on other people's chairs, could you,、um, if you're saving a chair, let us know if they're actually coming.、Uh, otherwise, we'll start letting people in on the wait list because there's there's a huge amount of interest in this very <laughs> esoteric、uh, evening that Alan has put together for us. So、uh, five more minutes while we get the、uh, all your all your fans sorted out. All right.
I think we're uh okay. I think we, we should let it go. Let it rip. Do you want the uh, dramatic lighting? Do you want some uh, do you want some of this back stuff off? Or you want it an easy? Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. David, please stay here a moment. I have, before we start, I have to say to you, confess to you, that a lot of you are here under slightly false pretenses. <laughs> because this was to be the last night of the bookworm. But I'm thrilled to be able to tell you that bookworm has at least one week's reprieve, and we have lots of ideas cooking up for continuing it. So before we start, let's have a huge applause to David. David Candelupo. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a caretaker for Alex Pearson's uh, genius. Uh, uh, Twenty some years ago, she collected the books in this room and uh, she started something very beautiful. And a bunch of us supported her to open this place in 2005. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful space. Uh, I hate to see it go, uh, but we gave it a good shot. So uh, now it is false pretenses because um, we've finagled another week, and uh, we'll have two more book talks. We'll have one last, basically Beethoven, which was something that started in Alex's living room many years ago. Uh, I think Anthony Tao is going to do a pub quiz on Friday night. We'll have. Uh, uh, CCC, some ribald comedy on Saturday night, and uh, maybe a final party on Sunday, and maybe the Jing Sing folks might come and sing us a tune. So we'll, we'll make an announcement, so it is false pretenses, um, <laughs> which I apologize for, um, but, I, but I'm not really that sorry. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you all, and, uh, uh, and RAS has been a great, great partner. Uh, many of you know Alex and Peter, uh, who put a lot of work in here, so I really thank the, the community has been so great this week. It's, it's brought a lot of uh, joy to me in a difficult time, so thanks. Well, now back to the glory days of the Ming and the Qing dynasty. Uh, this is going to be a, a debate, and the Motion is that the Ming were better than the Qing. <laughs> Very simple. 
And uh, the format, just to make sure everybody understands what it is, that our four principal speakers will each speak for 10 minutes in turn, first a Ming, then a Ching, then a Ming, then a Ching. And then they will have a team rebuttal, five minutes each team. And then, audience, over to you to destroy their arguments and make your points. I'd love you to control your enthusiasms and animosities while they're actually speaking. But we want this to be a, a really lively event, and I'm sure it will be. Uh, let me first introduce the speakers to you, in case you don't all know them. Mike Aldrich, who has come over from Taiwan, lived for many years in Beijing as a lawyer and is a wonderful historian. He rewrote the classic Guide to Beijing to update it. So he, he's uh, deeply steeped in the history of the Ming and Qing dynasty. Uh, Jeremiah Jenny hasn't come from quite so far, <laughs> but he is very well known to a lot of you as a wonderful guide around Beijing and to, perhaps to some of his pupils who are here as a wonderful teacher of Qing dynasty history. <laughs> uh, for the Ming, Ian Johnson I is a world famous journalist covering all aspects of China for a very long time and particularly now focusing on, on religion in China. And Francesco Sisi has been here for a long time, 30 years as a, as a diplomat and now a journalist. And he is the one person who can compare favorably the CPC and the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> we have in front of us our dragon timekeeper, who is known throughout Tsinghua as the fiercest timekeeper in the school who is going to keep an eye on the speakers to make sure we get everything done in time. Before we start, this is a debate. So we're going to have two polls, one before the debate starts and another at the end. So would you all please now, we have our scorekeeper here. Don't trust me. Uh, would you all, those of you who are in favor of the motion that the Ming are better than the Qing, raise your hands. Okay. Now, would the Ching please, 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 the Ching, raise your hands? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Look, this is this is somewhere in the balance between the Brexit vote in Britain <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, Hillary Clinton's majority of the popular vote in 2016. <laughs> 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 so, so this is the one, the one that matters. So we'll call it at the moment even, Stevens, and we'll see how it goes at the end. Okay, if you're all ready, the first speaker for the Ming Dynasty is Ian Johnson. Over oh, to you, Ian. Thank you. So after you know, realizing who was on the panel, you know, we have people who actually know something about the Ming and the Qing, and I'm just the dilettante journalist, I felt I needed some props. <laughs> and I thought also, I wouldn't just be Ian Johnson tonight, I would channel instead the first emperor of the Ming. <laughs> Zhu Yanzhang, who I think is the greatest emperor of the two dynasties. And um, so this is, of course, a, a classic polyester <laughs> Zhu Yanzhang <laughs> robe. Um, great. And I uh, got a sash. I'll, I'll put the whole thing on a little bit yeah, later. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> fine. It's all part of the, it's all part of the convincing. Yes, thank you. The hat, the hat, yes, the hat is going to really do it. Um, I just want to ask, where are we? We're in Beijing, right? We put the bay in Beijing. <laughs> we moved the capital here. True, the Yuan Dynasty had a capital here before we kicked their asses north of the Great Wall, which we hadn't yet built, but we would eventually build. <laughs> and then we established a capital here. It's been the capital of China for 600 years, and that was our doing. So that's the first thing. Secondly, what is the most famous part of Beijing, the most famous symbol of Beijing, besides the... the besides the bookworm. <laughs> yes. 
The Forbidden City. Curb your enthusiasms. <laughs> the Forbidden City, we built that also. We built the axis that goes through Beijing, the enduring central line that you know, goes through the, the Forbidden City up to the Bell and Drum Tower and all the way up to the Olympic Stadium, which we hadn't built yet, but which we would eventually. <laughs> we inspired, I would like to think, that we had something to do with that. Um, in terms of literature, tra traditionally Chinese speak of four great novels, three, three quarters, 75% were written in the Ming Dynasty. Uh, that's Yay. the Three Kingdoms, the Water Margin, and the uh, Journey to the West. Now, admittedly, maybe the greatest of the four, the, the Dream of the Red Chamber, was written in the Qing, but you know, <laughs> still, three out of four, I'll take the percentage rather than quality over qu or quantity over quality. Um, <laughs> Now, if you're buying furniture and you want to buy some sort of knockoff, Ming, Ming <laughs> exactly, Ming furniture clearly trumps Qing furniture. If you want to buy some knockoff bookcases for your expatty home, everybody, you know, hire a local furniture maker to do it. He'll say, well, of course you want the Ming style, right? Because the Qing style, it grows on you. It's kind of interesting, but it's all of these knobs and bits and bobs and just isn't that attractive, really. <laughs> um, okay. Um, how about something more serious uh, for once? How about borders? Now you may say, well, the Qing was much bigger than the Ming. The Qing was like twice as big as the Ming. It must be twice as good. That's great if you want to include a lot of troublesome regions that have <laughs> troubled China today. I don't want to go into any specific <laughs> locations, but I think you know what I mean. We were the empire of China proper, the place where 95% of Han Chinese live. We were the perfect borders for China in a way. Beijing in the north, and then sort of down to the south in Yunnan, the coastline, Shanghai, out to the Sichuan Basin. Perfect place, perfect borders. We knew, we were inspired by Taoism. The first emperor, me that is, uh, <laughs> came to power <laughs> thanks to uh, Taoist deity, Janu, the perfected warrior. And I like to think that we knew the the proper borders for China. Not that we wouldn't have preferred probably bigger borders, but for whatever reason, we had an, an empire that was, I think, really suitable for China. And then uh, we'll, we'll go into more serious things later when Francesco talks, because he actually knows what he's talking about. <laughs> but uh, I just want to say at the very ending, how does the dynasty end? The Qing dynasty ended pathetically, right? You got this guy, Pui, and then he sort of like hangs around the Forbidden City, can't decide what he's going to do. Uh, brings uh, you know some tutors in. He becomes a puppet of the Japanese, and then he becomes sort of brainwashed by the CCP and writes this unreadable memoir called "From Emperor to Citizen" that no one in the right mind should really read. And so he peters <laughs> off and dies before the Cultural Revolution. Is that a way to go? No. <laughs> we knew when our time was over. What did the last my successor do? He Hang went to himself. Jingshan Park and hung himself. <laughs> That's a manly thing to do when you know you've blown it. You just take the final, take the bullet, take the rope. So with that, I'd like to say, this is why the Ming deserves your respect and your vote. Thank you. Is that his reply? Mine is reply, but uh, Mike is your first speaker for the Qing. You're up. Over to you, Mike. the clock. <laughs> we, Team Tartar, bid you a good evening. <laughs> and we are confident that so many of you who are misguided and maybe influenced by flashy <laughs> clothing <laughs> of dubious <laughs> Ming Dynasty will come to be influenced by things that seem to be out of sense these days, to which I refer to reason and common sense. For ourselves, we do not agree with our learned, honorable, but horribly misguided opponents <laughs> that the greatness of a civilization will be found in its bricks and mortars. Those of you who studied Ozymandias understand that. Rather, the greatness of a civilization will be found in its intangible qualities. And I would, my Brother in arms, Jeremiah, and I would submit to you that the Qing Dynasty represented a height of intangible cultural qualities that dealt with multiculturalism that has been, aspersions have been cast upon by our honored but misguided opponent here. 
And that in and of itself reflected one of the highest attributes of Chinese civilization. For surely Confucius and Lao Tzu were describing philosophical views, artistic views, and so forth that were not meant for one people, but for all people throughout the world. Now to give you a certain illustration of what I'm trying to say, I would like you in your imagination to go with me to one of my favorite places in Beijing. And th that, that's Guozijian uh, Hutong, which is the north side of the city. If you go there, that, that is a wonderful tree-lined street that still has marble arches, memorable arches, those uh, pilo, one of the few streets that still preserves this classic Chinese tradition. And as you walk along that street, you come to the centerpiece, which is a marvelous temple to Confucius, also built in a non-Chinese dynasty. And as you approach it, you'll see a marble tablet that sensibly instructs all officials to dismount from their horses in a sign of reverence to Confucius. But in a reflection of an open-mindedness that we need rather desperately now in the 21st century, that same tablet bears the same instructions in Manchu, Mongolian, Uyghur, Oirat, Hungarian, for those who don't know what Oirat is. <laughs> if you don't know it's Hungarian, I'll explain that one later. Uh, <laughs> and Uyghur, Syriac Arabic. And I take this one little site, a quiet, tame village street, which it once was, as a symbol of the greatness of the Qing. Now, the great aspects of the Qing are intangible, and they're hard to find. You know, and I would like to be able to mention a few of them. In Islam, one of the greatest high points of Islamic philosophy was written by a Chinese Confucian scholar by the name of Liu Chu. His book was actually endorsed, well, seen by the emperor, or so was the imprint on the first page. Liu Chu explained that there was no conflict between Islamic principles and Confucianism. To him, the whole idea of the, idea of the class of civilizations would have been incomprehensible. And he articulated Islamic philosophy in a non Islamic idiom, not Arabic, not Persian, but translated the concepts into Chinese. Likewise, we have the late 19th century in Eastern Tibet that sought to resolve many of the disputes between the different branches of Tibetan Buddhism, red hat, many red hat sects versus the yellow hat. And the Rinne movement, under influence from the Qing, so to be able to harmonize these different conflicts, which is a perspective that continues to be embraced by Tibetan Buddhists within the country and beyond. Halk Mongolia, which is sometimes called Outer Mongolia, for geopolitical reasons was delighted to be part of the Qing Empire because they, were accept they requested assistance from the Kangxi Emperor who accepted the request led a coalition army, this time one defending people under attack, uh, of Manchus, Mongolians, and Chinese, and brought the Halk Mongolians into the empire. There are other aspects of all of this, of course. The old summer palace was built with designs that were presented by fabulous Jesuit scholars at the Qing court, and it replicated Versailles. The first Russian or I should say the first modern treaty was made between Tsarist Peter's court, Tsar Peter's court and the Qing, establishing what it was an ecclesiastical mission which in existed until 1954 until it was turned into the Soviet Empire. These were the initial connections between the West and China, which are utterly forgotten, usually not addressed, but were exceptionally modern. They were modern because they were accepted by the Manchus, a people who came from beyond the Great Wall, that pile of bricks and mortars that was as effective as Trump's wall will be. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Ming loyalist who just joined us. I, I'm doing okay. <laughs> I, I'm feeling good. Jake, this is very Jake. good. 
Uh, I'll register you to vote later. Um, <laughs> but you had, in essence, a people who, by their very nature, needed to be multicultural. Now, I assume a certain learned opponents of mine sitting in the audience will wish to draw an assault against the fact that the, the Qing eventually sold out and became more and more Chinese. To which I will reply with a bow and arrow of Manchu style to say, but of course, <laughs> certainly for someone who lives in China, with the passage of time, one becomes more and more Chinese. That does not negate your origins. So I would submit it to you that in the values of the 21st century, the things that are very meaningful to us, things that perhaps may not be as popular at the end of the 21st century, multiculturalism and diversity, uh, unity and cohesion rather than division were the goals and ideals of the Qing dynasty, which you can't see unlike a pile of bricks and mortar. With that, I thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you. I'm uh, on the Ming team because I'm Italian. And uh, <laughs> we have, uh, as Italians, we cannot forget what uh, the Ming dynasty did to us, welcoming for the first time a foreigner to the court, which was exactly, well, not more than 400 years ago, but uh, we have a long memory. We have... Uh, <laughs> All the uh, civilizations, we can't forget uh, the, 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 the gratefulness that, that we were bestowed by the Ming Dynasty. On a more serious note, I would say that the Ming Dynasty was the first one which was saved and both doomed, both saved and doomed by the contact with the outside world. That is, uh, there was a crisis, a financial and economic crisis in the mid of 16th century. And uh, at the end of the 16th century, actually, there was um, uh, a, a lot of attention and interest in buying silk and vases from China, from Spanish uh, empire, the, the Spanish empire that had um, established themselves in uh, Manila in 1570, actually one year before the Battle of Lepanto, in, uh, which was in 1571, which was the first time the Turkish advance was checked in the Mediterranean. So even before the Turkish, were, uh, the Turkish forces were checked, the Spanish were uh, buying uh, silk and bringing uh, silver that saved and uh, and helped the, the growth of the Ming Empire and uh, actually helped the, the empire to survive. And at this point, at the end of the 16th century, um, the, the Jesuits came in through Macau. At the time, Philip II was the king of Spain and Portugal. Actually, it was Philip II in Portugal and Philip III in Spain. Um, they threw Portugal, through Macau, the Jesuits came in and, and um, Matteo Ricci reached Beijing. But most importantly, in 1602 or three, uh, Emperor Wan Li ordered the first Western style map of the world. And for him, Matteo Ricci designed this map and uh, showed to the emperor and to the Chinese court, what the world was really about, at least according to the Western standards. So it was the first time China really opened to the world, to the global world. I would contend that the Qing, yes, they were open, but only regionally open. The Ming were really globally, for the first time, globally open. <laughs> 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 of, 
well, 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 but, but globally open, you know, is uh, the, we, we, next time we go Yuan versus Qing or Yuan versus Ming. But uh, now let's stick to the, our point. And um, I would say, and um, most importantly, also, the one the emperor understood the importance of the global world and tried to understand through Matteo Ricci, through the Jesuits, what these uh, foreigners wanted, really. However, unfortunately for uh, the Ming dynasty, um, there was a crisis in the Western world and they were not, the Ming were not quite aware of that. The crisis was the war of Spain against the Dutch and the British. Uh, which was uh, bleeding their uh, resources and their silver. And then the beginning of the 30 years war in the 1618, these events were uh, totally depleting the coffers of uh, Spain. And for this reason, Philip IV then, who was the successor of Philip II III, um, decided to stop the smuggling of silver. That is, the smuggling of silver is actually buying, selling silver in, in, in return for, uh, for silk. And by stopping the smuggling of silver soon enough, in about one decade, between 6030 and 6040, uh, there was a huge inflation in China, and silver, versus copper because it, they had the two denomination, the value quadrupled in less than uh, 10 years, which was a huge inflation at the time. Uh, peasants uh, and farmers had no money to pay the taxes, which were in silver, whereas uh, trade was in copper. And um, then there was an uprising, Li Zicheng started the uprising, the last emperor hanged himself, somebody, you know, the, the perfidious uh, Manchu with, uh, the tried to, s pretended to save the Ming, but actually toppled the Ming. But uh, most importantly, I think that uh, exactly 200 years after, the Qing dynasty didn't understand, had not understood Chinese history. Because uh, the mistake of the Ming was not fully comprehending and coping and dealing with the outside world, that is the West. 200 years after, with the opium crisis in Guangdong, they, they repeated a, a similar mistake. They closed themselves, they didn't open up, they didn't want to understand, so they wasted all the Ming uh, experience. And this is, I think, also an important thing that we now have to remember, how China should not close itself but learn from the Ming, take the Jesuits in and the Catholic Church, <laughs> <laughs> follow its wise guidance and save itself. <laughs> Jeremiah, over to you. After this event, we're all going to go outside and ceremoniously light our visas on fire. <laughs> Toppled? Toppled? Now, I don't know if this particular Ming emperor was well hung, but he was well hanged. When you hang yourself, <laughs> and then one of your generals on the frontier says, come on in. I don't know if that's toppled. It sounds to me like they were just the only people trying to impose a little sense of order in a relatively complex world. Now, I'm going to talk, I mean, we talk about the Ming Dynasty, and, you know, the guy who hanged himself, Chongzhen Emperor, you know, he's not a bad guy, given, this, given who he comes from. Let's think about the Ming Emperors for a moment, people. This was a dynasty that lost an emperor. They misplaced his ass. They went out to fight the Mongolians, and when they got back to Beijing, they're like, holy shit, I thought you had them. <laughs> That's not to me, you're talking about the Wanli Emperor. Love the Wanli Emperor, man. He got so scared by all that stuff, he went into his bedroom and shut the door for 12 years. That's hell of a staff work right there. And that's not even, I mean, that's not even counting the one emperor that pooped himself to death after only 28 days in power. So we're not exactly talking Kang Shi, Yong Zheng, Qian Long on the throne, are we? <laughs> All 
also, and I don't want to step on any toes of my fine colleague from Italy, <laughs> but I do believe that there was a man named Giuseppe Castiglione <laughs> who was all about helping the Qing Dynasty. You know, I think one of the things about the Qing Dynasty, too, and you mentioned this, it's all about the multiculturalism. The Qing Empire had probably more in common with the Ottomans than they did with the Ming Dynasty. These were self-consciously multicultural emperors who were playing to constituencies all over Asia. They could be Chinese emperors, like Ian and his uh, Silk Market special. <laughs> I was gonna shave my head in a queue, but Ian sucked all the cultural appropriation oxygen out of the room. <laughs> but they could, they could talk about the Confucianism, they could bring the poetry, they could bring the history, they could bring the classics all day. In fact, that's why so many people today think, oh yeah, the, the Manchus, they just became like the Chinese. But when the Manchu emperors left the room, when Chinese officials left the room, and the Manchu emperors were still there and they invited in their representatives from Central Asia, then they wouldn't wear the fancy yellow robes, they'd wear the furs of a Khan. And they wouldn't talk about Confucianism, they wouldn't talk about poetry, they'd talk about, hey, we going tiger hunting next week? <laughs> These guys could do the calligraphy and they could go out and do mounted archery. That's some serious skill. So when we think about the borders of the Qing Empire, and yes, I understand that these borders have bequeathed a legacy, which I will not talk about, <laughs> because the bookworm's already closing. <laughs> But let's be clear, that is a serious territorial legacy. Kangxi Emperor riding out into the desert. You talked about our friends, the Zungars. Where are the Zungars now? No, there's no more Zungars because of the Kangxi Emperor. From 16... <laughs> well, you know, you guys had your own chance with this. I mean, if you only were able to go beyond a wall rather than build a wall. And by the way, Mongolians didn't pay for that wall. Now, some of you are gonna come at us, they're gonna go, what about the Empress Dowager, right? I know somewhere there's gonna be a question out there, maybe even the minds of our esteemed uh, counterparts. What about the Empress Dowager, she? I walk around the Summer Palace all the time, I hear the tour guide saying, this is where the Dragon Lady slept. <laughs> this is where the Dragon Lady killed her son. I mean, all, all this stuff about the Dragon Lady. I'm gonna give you this right now. Maybe, I'm not gonna say that she was a nice person. <laughs> She was straight up gangster and a cheap pal. I get that. <laughs> but what I will say is this. Woman held things together for 47 years, and I think a lot of people blame this person because anytime stuff goes wrong, anytime shit hits the fan, it's really tempting to find an ambitious woman and just blame them. And I'll, one last thing I'm going to say is right now, because you guys brought up the opium. I, I get the whole opium war, end of the Ming, 100 years of humiliation. Let's just point out this way. You got to, I mean, she held things together at the, in the 19th century when the whole world came crashing in on China, one right after another. I mean, you got to think, with the wisdom of the Kangxi Emperor, with the his wisdom of, with the strength of Han Wudi, have been able to fix some of the incredible problems that were not the fault of the Qing Empire. To blame the Qing Empire for what was happening in the 19th century is like I walk through, like, you know, I walk out in Boston somewhere, someone smacks me on the head in the baseball bat, and then everybody wake up and like, you know, everyone's like, so uh, why were you hitting yourself in the head with a baseball bat? You know, the idea is this was not their fault. It all came crashing down on them. And yet, somehow, they still held things together as long as they could. When the rest of the world, if you look at what's going on in the 19th century around the world, everything else is falling apart. One of the last places to hang on as long as they could was the Qing Empire. And so for that reason, and for that reason, and, and that and many other reasons, I'm sticking with Team Manchu right now. Thank you very much. Well, now it is, is the, each side has a chance now to rebut the others. Five minutes for the, each, each team. Mi Ming goes first and then Ching. So well, here are counter arguments. The inevitable 
Donald Trump Great Wall comparison would come. Let me tell you, there's an idea that walls don't work because people think that there was no battle fought at the Great Wall. But the Great Wall actually was successful because the Ming lasted longer than the Qing. It lasted nine years longer. Uh, <laughs> you know, but it wasn't, like a fa it wasn't like some weak empire that didn't last for a long time or failed after 100 years or something like that. The Great Wall had great symbolic value, and uh, the Ming was actually on the north side of the wall a lot of the time. Um, but it was, you know, I, I think this is this politically correct idea now we have that walls don't work. But uh, they worked for the East Germans for 28 years before. <laughs> and, and militarily, <laughs> it, it actually did. It kept the country going. For, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, I think the wall, and the wall didn't fail militarily. It only failed because the Ming was in turmoil and stuff like that. But anyways, um, there's also this idea, you know, that the Ming started out open and then they closed off. There was Zheng He on his adventures, and then he was sort of closed off. Then they built the wall and became inward looking. But I think as Francesco pointed out, the Ming was actually really open uh, to the outside world. Uh, and was able to, uh, you know, had a lot of trade and so on with the outside world. So there's sort of myths that the Ming was closed off, but it's not really true. I think also just one thing about the Qing, I, the multicultural thing is such BS. <laughs> because <laughs> it's, uh, t the, the Qing was a classic gunpowder empire that took advantage of slightly superior technology and a huge population to just roll out the borders of China westward. Um, did it work well for the Muslims? I mean... The Qing even enlisted Tibetan Buddhism and the myth of the Shambhala on crusades against Islam in the Qing dynasty, in, in wars uh, in the uh, 19th century. So yeah, they wrote things in, multi in different languages, but it wasn't as if it was all because of some kumbaya, we are the world, enlightened <laughs> idea, or something like that. That was what happens when you invade another country and have to run it for a while. You have to also learn other languages. I mean, it's not some sort of like a great... <laughs> Great thing, like, wow, great. I think also, you know, the Qing always strikes me sort of as a, as a kind of a, an inward-looking, insecure empire. Like, the, the, the Manchus were never really comfortable in their skins. They had this idea, yeah, we're going to have the, you know, go hunting out in, in Chengdu and stuff like that. But when you look at, the, you know, I was talking about the novels, that three of the four novels were written in the Ming, and you have a lot of great things that happen in the Ming, like the Li Shijun, the great Chinese medicine, uh, doctor, he, he came up with scientific works like that. The Qing were all about works of diligence, like the Kangxi Da Tzu Dian. You know, you get a lot of people together and they work on some giant project that's all about hard work and I'll keep the keep the, the the Chinese busy doing something like that so they don't become a threat to us. <laughs> and uh, and actually, you know, the Kangxi Emperor, he was like the greatest failure. He had the Jesuit education. He could have really modernized China. Um, instead, it just goes downhill, and then you end up with the Qianlong Emperor. He's sort of like the Louis the Sixteenth of China. You know, it's like looks great, and then afterwards, the whole country falls off a cliff. So that's like my rebuttal. Yeah, just just a, a footnote on what uh, he said. That uh, just to stress uh, how open the Ming were compared to the Qing, to the false myth of the Qing, if I may. Uh, we have two instances. One we referred to was. Um, the openness toward the outside world, towards the Spanish, and uh, that were encroaching from, uh, from actually uh, the East, from Americas, from Mexico then. But also <laughs> the projection, as uh, Ian mentioned, of uh, Zheng He. It was projecting to India, to Africa, to the outside world. So they were really opened to the sea. They wanted to know what the world was about. The Qing, conversely, were all about Central Asia. And just Central Asia. They were making sure that Central Asia wouldn't cause any trouble, which is fine. Uh, as, but, you know, Central Asia was not going to get any trouble because Russia and the Mughal empires were already occupying that space. But the real threat, the real problem for China, as it was revealed later, was this new civilization coming from uh, the East, from Americas, in, I mean, East. Uh, and uh, this was the thing that the Ming emperor realized. Unfortunately, the Qing didn't learn. And incidentally, yes, there were the Jesuits also during the Qing, but eventually the Manchu emperor banned them and kicked them out. So.
I gratefully yield one minute of my time to my brother in arms, Jeremiah. <laughs> There's this talk about the Qing Empire being closed. That's because they were closed to the European traders. Have you ever smelled a European in 1800? I'd be closed too. <laughs> Let's point out that the Qing actually had markets throughout their borders. They were one of the most open empires. They just were a little closed when it came to people from England who didn't have a whole lot else to sell them. And so when people showed up and said, you've got to stop manipulating your currency, change your trade policy to free and fair standards of international trade. <laughs> they were like, I get a feeling we're going to be hearing this for the next 200 years. <laughs> right before you guys start selling us drugs. Yeah. Well said, Brother Jeremiah. Uh, I have two considered responses to our learned, honorable, but horribly misguided opponents. <laughs> the first response is balderdash. The second is snort, again, snort. I won't make that noise. Uh, but quite simply, it is a question of intangibilities now, isn't it? One of the things that has always been an aspect of Chinese civilization that appeals to so many people. The, the, the brothers and sisters Sinophiles who are here tonight, be they of foreign or not foreign origin, is this seed that Chinese society, Chinese civilization emphasize that its teachings, its ideals, its higher points were not meant for any particular people of a particular color, complexion, genetic perspective. This were, were what Confucius and Lao Tzu taught were ideas and principles that were to apply throughout the world. And this high point of ideas, the last time that we had a, an imperial dynasty that embraced and promoted those viewpoints was the Qing. They had to. They were outsiders who spent years translating and learning Chinese classical literature, including those jury novels from the Ming, <laughs> uh, <laughs> political philosophy and other things. They spent years rehearsing their role to be the rulers of China while never rejecting their past and providing space for other viewpoints which invariably fall out of the discussion when we make the mistake that China, Chinese civilization is only a civilization of Han Chinese people. The fact that you had superb Muslim philosophers who were Confucian officials, along with uh, the Tibetan scholars who created a synthesis. You had a multiculturalism terrible word, politically correct, but politically right, was an aspect of the Qing dynasty that still finds a certain resonance, I think, among us Sinophiles, be us Western or Chinese. And I think that just quite simply what we would have with Lao Tzu or Zhuang Tzu looking at the culture and civilization, not the big men at top, not the warfare, not the geopolitics, politics, all these lesser things. But you would have Confucius and Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu looking down on the Qing society and civilization and say, well done. One last comment I would have to point out to my learned opponent, Francesco, that he mentioned that when Manny Ricci arrived in China, there was this very, very positive response on the part of the Ming. I do not think that is very distinctive. I do not think there could be any other reaction to any people meeting an erudite, sophisticated, and elegant Intel Italian scholar. Any country would be wowed <laughs> by that. <laughs> the Ming only had the benefit of being first not necessarily making a better choice, simply it was the choice that any sensible empire would make. Well, we've had quite a disquisition of world history, and we welcome 
comments, inputs, and questions from the floor? Excuse me, we'll please wait for a microphone because you, the audience, otherwise won't hear the question. I hope we're going to get another microphone in here so that one speaker and the next speaker can get the second microphone. So I, I can use this one really quick. Um, just a quick question on uh, regarding the Qing Dynasty um, as far as the, uh, the multiculturalism, the, the embracement of, of foreign ideas and foreign acceptance. Did they not sort of run somewhat of a caste system? Meaning if you look at Beijing, you had the Tartar city, which was controlled by the Manchus, and then the Chinese city, which was outside of, out of that, which is where the business would have been. The Banner people would have been living in the city. They would not have been engaging in any meaningless employment or things like that. Um, was it not, well, you know, skewed, shall we say, for, for the Manchus? Uh, first thing I would say is that would be the persistence of memory, that the idea that you had separate settlements for different ethnic groups living in China was characteristic of Chang'an during the Tang Dynasty. And while I do not think that this is necessarily a modern or progressive move, at the same time, there was this understanding that, okay, well, we are now the rulers, we don't take the entire city. Did they allocate the best to themselves? Well. That can be debated. But nonetheless, in terms of the, ge the political philosophy that existed at that time, there wouldn't have been this idea of multiculturalism as we quite have it today. But it certainly did not involve the ideas that our subject people would have to be decimated. Let me turn this over to Brother Jeremiah. They definitely took the best for themselves. Who wants to live in Fungkai, let's be honest. <laughs> But I've got one word for you, smallpox. The Manchus didn't have a lot of experience with it. The Chinese had all kinds of experience with it. And that was a big reason why they wanted to be separated. Well, I know also just one thing I think is always interesting listening to the defense of the Qing. It always reminds me of a typical argument that colonialists make. You know, it's sort of like you can make the same arguments for the British in India. You can say, well, you know, they learned this and they learned that and they were tolerant and many great things happened during their rule. But at the end of the day, they were basically foreign rulers. <laughs> Next question. This is the guy who defended the Berlin Wall. Can you hear me? Yes. So I have one. Hold the <coughs> okay, I'll hold it as close as I can. Uh, one, observ one observation. Uh, without the Ming, there could have been no Qing. So Liu Haqi learnt in in Ming China, and he studied the stories of Zhuge Liang. Um, he studied. I mean, you talked about the Tao, which is true, but actually the, the Ming began with the with the with Buddhism, um, with be and began with that wonderful. <coughs> the mix of Buddhism and Taoism, which was magical. And so then my next, I guess it's a question, maybe if they've got time to answer the question, which is neither, yeah. neither yeah. side. So it's a, the same question to both of you. We didn't really define what great was. I think the thing is, which is the greatest <laughs> dynasty, but you've all talked about power. You've all talked about, well, you talked a lot about multiculturalism and you've kind of defended it, but none of you have talked about the people. None of you have talked about ideas or dreams you've touched a little bit on the books, but it seems to me <laughs> like, <Books>. like <coughs> well, it seems to me like Ming was an extraordinary time with many Chinese ideas, and the Qing was a time of building on those extraordinary Chinese ideas, and a little bit like that furniture, making it much more polished and much more sophisticated, but the real genius of the ideas, I think, was Ming. <laughs> You talk about um, just um, intangibles, um, for example. Okay, intangibles. Ming is the one, or Zhu Yuanzhang is the one, introduced a centralized Zhongyang Jiquan, centralized governing, uh, which Qing Dynasty followed the same system and reinforced it, number one. Number two, you mentioned about Guo Zidian. That was introduced by Zhu Yuanzhang as well. Well, Guo Zijian was built in during the Mongolian that Empire. 
that was a, a, a Beijing one, but Zhu Yuanzhang was the one introduced it in Nanjing. I'd like to address this because Zhu Yuanzhang was an interesting guy. Uh, he was, first of all, not a very attractive man. He looked like his face had been put on fire and then put out with a rake. <laughs> but more importantly, Zhu Yuanzhang abolishes his own prime minister, which also creates a meaning that the emperor had to be his own chief executive. One of the innovations, and the Manchu, by the way, the Qing Empire had innovations, including the Board of Colonial Affairs, and most importantly, the Junji Chu, the Office of the Grand Council, which had an executive function and allowed, especially towards the 18th and 19th century, to overcome the mistakes of the Ming, which meant if you had a weak emperor, they were not bound by the rules that had been set forth by Jiu and Cheng that ultimately, in times of weak central leadership, undermined the entire empire. Thank you. Another question at the back? Well, no, so I would just say, um, you know, the idea is, for example, probably the most influential philosopher in China after Mao Zedong in the past m half millennia <laughs> was Wang Yangming, the Neo-Confucian, right? So Wang Yangming, Ming Dynasty, right? So this is the kind of ideas that came around in the Ming. He's still probably the most influential. He certainly, I've heard it told, I can't tell for sure, but he's Xi Jinping's favorite philosopher. And, um, you know, uh, he is still relevant today. Um, so you had a real ferment of ideas and culture and so on at that time. And not to mention, the vases were a lot better. Actually, <laughs> it was funny, because when I tweeted that I'm doing this debate, Craig Clunas at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the curator there, he tweeted back to me a picture of a Qing vase, which is in a purple and garish and all that, and a classic Ming vase, blue and white with a dragon, and he said, you've won the argument. I'm so glad you answered the lady's question by referring to the people. <laughs> you referred to Wang Yangming, who was a Confucian literati of high level, and porcelain. I think this evening we did refer to religious beliefs and philosophical beliefs that were important to a multiculturalism that did exist here. An empire was quite simply a collection of people. And a collection of people that were able to express themselves in ways that usually drops out of most of our texts on Chinese history because invariably we wind up absorbing so many of the Han Chinese bias about what is truly Chinese. What is China? It, 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 in what does China mean? You know, so you see, or, or my interlocutor said, it is China. And my response is, yes, and what does China mean? What are the borders of China? What has always been China? What's within it? And I don't see it as exclusively Han Chinese, but I adhere to the Qing viewpoint and to a multicultural viewpoint that hopefully will become stronger with time rather than weaker. Francesca, are you going to comment on that? Yeah, maybe it's an interesting point, interesting point, what is China? And I would say, as a reference, what is the West? Uh, because uh, it's, it's, uh, it is very interesting to me because uh, actually this is also s could be subject of a different debate. China remained China, locally defined, and in the place is more or less the same. It expanded, it shrank. But the, this is the place. The West changed its border. It first began around Greece, then uh, went to Rome, then moved up to England, and then even transferred to a whole different continent, America. You know, this is the, and now maybe it includes Japan, we don't know. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so, but China is, uh, is China, and in this, uh, sense geography is it is uh, the substance whereas uh, for the west it's more like an ideal uh, and um, what is this ideal we don't know but uh, as the continent itself in its definition then i would say again the ming found a balance found a balance in opening up to the world keeping the wall and that is controlling the disturbances from the Central Asia and this uh, noise and uh, from the M Mongolians and the Manchu outside, only 
the discovery of America and its silver, the arrival of its silver, the, the start, the beginning of the Spanish colonization of Philippines, tipped the balance and changed the whole chemistry, political chemistry of the time. However, again, I would say the Manchu learned nothing of that experience and squandered the fabulous uh, uh, experience they had uh, with the Ming, closing themselves, including trying to control these uh, Central Asian, uh, let's call it with their name, barbarians, um, whereas the real thing was coming from a different direction. Thank you. Right. Is there another question at the back? Quick question John? For you. No, the what who has the microphone? Thank you. So, quick question: What Thank kind you. of em what kind of empire needs fifty million people to die to stop a rebellion of a guy who thinks he's Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> the Romans. My friend, it is an empty question because quite simply, multiculturalism as existed in the Qing was not Princeton University or Columbia or some other place. You're looking at the inevitable conflict that comes about in a society, in a civilization that has an empire and has yet to adopt human issues. So to, say, to, to address your issue, these were horrendous events happened in the Qing as they did in the Ming. We have a phrase called Ming despotism that appears in occasionally in most books about in, in written in English about Chinese history. So there were these things. Now, I lived in Mongolia for six years. I set up the first international law firm in Mongolia. Uh, they sent me up in July of 2009 and said I'd be home in time for Christmas. They said that during the war, too. I, I lived there for six years. I know the Mongolian perspective on their history on that era, but at the same time, I think that there's a lot of resentment that it comes about from a distortion or a particular interpretation of their history, which is a reflection of current resentments rather than an objective viewpoint. And I, I would bow to this one Danish scholar, Eskelson uh, is his name, who wrote a book, fabulous book called Our Great Ching, which examines Mongolian sources and illustrates the viewpoint that the Mongolians, at least those who wrote, the higher elites of society, viewed themselves as in an alliance with the Great Ching. Certainly, there was wealth and power behind that. Certainly, they had a higher level of social status over Han Chinese, at least in Outer Mongolia. Uh, but the viewpoint in the past is very, very different from what many people express today. And I think it, it, it's, it's in many ways present resentments being dragged into the past. I, 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 I acknowledge those viewpoints. I, I don't dispute that they're there. Uh, I don't think that they are balanced sadly, and there winds up being some racial antipathy underlying that, which unfortunately, even in our multicultural world, is always, always lurking somewhere. Can I intervene with a question? So the lady in the red get mm. the microphone next. Oh, no, you want, can I just intervene with a question sure. first? Uh, uh, following up on an earlier question, uh, could uh, the panels please tell us 
which was better for the common man of China? Was it, was it better to be, was it better to be a, a peasant than an ordinary person in the Ming or the Qing dynasty? Equally horrible. <laughs> that was my question. My response would be it would have been equally horrible. I'd go with the population grew significantly during the uh, 130 years of the Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Xinlong reign, in due large part to stability, but also to the introduction and of new crops from outside, uh, like uh, the sweet potato, corn, and others as well that opened up all kinds of new arable land, made things a little bit easier at least uh, for the people who are living there. Yeah, I think there's a huge population increase, but these are kind of secular, as you might say in economic terms, secular changes that are due to uh, you know, gr new crops being imported and things like that, and not uh, by some you know, benevolent of the government. But yeah, it's hard. I think it's really hard to know wh what the standard of living was in I, I, I think, w w I, I in terms of standard of living, I, I do think we would have to agree that it was hard. It was absolutely abhorrent to be a common person in terms of facing the challenges of the world. There are things that could have benefited quite clearly, uh, as Brother Jeremiah has said, the arrival of foreign foods at least allowed people to, to care for themselves more, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were subject to enlightened officials, and ultimately the Qing and the Ming would have to be viewed in the Gok as equally culpable of having people who would succumb to corruption and ego, familiar traits that we have to contend <laughs> with. Maybe even more micro in our evaluation of the two dynasties. As we are Beijingers, and this is the center, from a Beijing perspective, people living specifically here, what would their perspective have been in living within one week in the Qing dynasty? I am. I, I think uh, this is a very interesting question, but uh, again, I would say this is a point for the Ming Dynasty. Why? This is um, because uh, the first emperor, the, the first uh, Ming emperor, moved the capital to Beijing. Why move the, ca the capital to Beijing and build the Great Wall? Because in this way, it was 30 miles, 40 miles from the Great Wall. So in case <laughs> the uh, Manchu, the Mongols attacked, he could immediately send troops and intervene and make a decision very, very quickly. So he had uh, uh, control over the steps. In fact, the Manchu, to get in and conquer China, whatever it is, uh, they had uh, the help of the Ming generals, who helped the Ming generals, thinking that Manchu would uh, help uh, the, the poor Ming and restore the Ming. But uh, this is a different story. It's a history of uh, betrayal, I must say. Um, so they, and at the same time, the Ming emperor was able, from Beijing, to send troops south and then control any uprising. So it was a geographic and geopolitical decision that changed the history of China. And if you couple this with the opening really to the outside world, then Beijing was really the center of the world, both in the central of the central steps because of the, of the wall, which was uh, a way of communication also, not only to keep away the barbarians, but also communicate and control the barbarians, and to control the, the, the sea, the people from the sea and, uh, and outsiders. So Beijing was really the capital. However, with the Manchu Empire, I think Beijing became much more closed. And um, um, different story, I would say. <laughs> 
I always think of the Manchus as sort of like the furniture polishers. <laughs> they, you know, they inherited this wonderful thing that we built, and we really thank them for having taken good care of it, repairing the buildings in the Forbidden City when they burned down, and doing a nice job. And it's kind of touching afterwards when the Qing falls, the Manchus sort of reinvent themselves as custodians of Lao Beijing culture. Um, but, you know, I think ultimately it, there's a lot of sort of, 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 of following up on things that had been created earlier. Listen, I, I'm not a Beijinger, obviously. I'm just one of five white guys on stage talking about Chinese history. <laughs> <laughs> but I love this city. I love Beijing. And I got to tell you, there's so much about Beijing that we got to owe us a little bit of debt of gratitude to the Manchus and the Bachi, who for whom a lot of what we do think of as Lao Beijing and Lao Beijing Wenhua, as a lot of it is Manchu and Bachi Wenhua. I'd like to point out that the reason the Ming Dynasty moved their capital up here was because the Yongle Emperor, or Zhu Di, barbecued a close relative. <laughs> and it actually took nearly until the 1440s before the Ming could even make up their mind which capital they wanted. At least once the Qing Dynasty figured that they were going to conquer China, they moved their emperor down here and they kept his ass here. So, and the other thing too, just to think about Beijing as a layout of the city, even up until 1644, the mid-17th century, when the wars of Li Zicheng and others kind of laid real waste to the city, the city was quite empty in large parts because as the capital was being developed, you know, there wasn't necessarily the same level, although it was increasing, of commercial sophistication, market sophistication, and even social sophistication that you'd find later in the 17th, 18th century under the Qing emperors. You had new markets opening up, a much more complicated system of temple markets and temple fairs. And so I think if you were to say which, which city would we rather go back to and hang out in, I got to think that Qing Dynasty Beijing was actually the far more exciting, far more interesting, and far cooler place to hang. That's just my feeling. Yep. <laughs> I concur with Brother Jeremiah. Um, and just one more thought, and that is this, that I, you know, for the romantics in the audience, I think there might be a, a few of you here tonight, given the topic. Um, I, I think it's important to bear in mind that the images that we carry of old China, which has a very, very deep, emotional attraction for us, be us from China or not, that the images of old China that we have within our capital city are simply the legacies of the Qing Dynasty, whether it be the New Summer Palace or the Dongyue Ma Miao or the Confucian Temple, the final refinements of Beijing that we visualize as old China are those that we've inherited from the Manchus. And these are things that, again, I would say, that give a certain flavor and feeling to our lives in China, to the affection that we feel for the city, and for what we know and how we love, for the most part, what China is these days. So I, I would say that, yes, what, we, what strikes a chords in our heart are the remnants of the Manchu dynasty, which was Chinese and Manchu and Tibetan and et cetera. Maybe a question from the back of the microphone, please. Can you talk a little bit about what they were tolerant in the Ming dynasty for our audience? Is, uh, you mentioned a little bit about ethnic cleansing in the Ming dynasty and about the role of women in general in being affected by this. Well, can I broaden it? I want to hear more about the I'd be inclined to take a first cut <laughs> at answering that question and to say uh, both dynasties were equally deplorable. <laughs> and one can cherry pick certain things from one dynasty or the other. I don't know if you've noticed that this evening. Um, but you could <laughs> cherry pick things from one dynasty or the other in order to be able to, to make a point. I mean, there is a sort of I feel a certain value to the Manchu perspective, which was, well, you know, we don't encourage foot binding. 
and Manchu women cannot have their feet bound because that was viewed uh, as a way of, I think through their you know, traditional non-Ming perspective was a derogation, a de degradation of people who would play an essential role with the creation of an empire. But quite simply, the answer to the question is equally deplorable because you would have had, you know, in essence, chattel slavery, whereby women would be sold uh, as, as cattle. Um, you would have women not having decision making within their homes in either dynasty uh, unless they were exceptionally talented at commerce or, or exceptionally strong willed, wi which there were people who were that. Um, but overall, there's nothing that exists in that those two dynasties that I think either side of this table could point to as saying, well, this is, this is something that's admirable. I don't think there was, y you'd have to struggle real hard to find anything. I struggle just to point to the Manchu's reluctance to tolerate bound feet for their own tribe. Yeah, uh, I don't really necessarily have a lot of questions, so I just want to chime in to uh, get out something out of my mind is, I think the lady actually earlier posed a really good idea, is Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty essentially is great for whom? So I think taking from the points of view from peasants, definitely, um, of course, they lived an equally horrible life, but I would at least concede that people lived in Qing Dynasty had marginally better life than Ming Dynasty. And uh, of course, in addition to the um, introduction of foreign crops, and they didn't have to face this uh, land annexation by the aristocrats. And um, so, and also thanks to the land kind of reformation by the certain uh, Qing Dynasty emperors, so actually the peasants lived a better life. So, but since most of us here are intellectuals, probably the intellectuals hated Qing Dynasty because they faced severe censorship. On the other hand, for the intellectuals, they would love to live in Ming Dynasty where they don't pay taxes at all. And they live <laughs> free off from the blood and tears from the peasants. And the aristocrats, they just breed, breed, breed like Catholic rats. <laughs> and they take all the lands. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And until, s oh, oh, sorry. I shouldn't have used that Catholic, um, I forgot about the Catholic part. It's, you're just free like going, rats Mr. President. rabbits. Mm -hmm. And they took the lands of all the peasants. So in the end, kind of Chinese history has repeated itself over and over again. Pretty much in all second half of all dynasties is all the conflict between the people and the land. So who did a better job kind of for the people in keeping their livelihoods, I think, Essentially, Qing Dynasty did a slightly better job, but also in the end, depending on your point of view, to who made history, it were it the peasant, were it the commoners, or the intellectuals, or the elites. I, I would point out that in terms of the question of which dynasty is better, that's sort of the questions that they have at intelligence squared debates. And if you notice, there's no right or wrong answers to those. Um, it's a question of, how you define what is better. I mean, I, I was working off of the question of what, what is a superior culture, and I just interpreted that in terms of particular viewpoints that Jeremiah and I agree with. Uh, but I think fundamentally one of the great incredible challenges and frustrations of dealing with Chinese history is the fact that time and again the common people left us no record of their own voice because they didn't write. So there's a tremendous amount of speculation that goes into this. There's a tremendous amount of looking at public records and so forth, but we never hear the voices of the people in terms of that. So I, I wind up saying, I don't know. I wish I could know. Uh, I, I, I suspect that what you've said has a ring of truth to it, but I also know that at the end of the day, it is speculation because those voices disappeared into the ether.
one more question. One more question after that. Um, I'd like to pick up on a point that changed me today, which is this idea that the change industry held on to a monolith of things that are outside sources and pushed them out. I don't think that's true. I think what Hinder Beers was from, you mentioned the Summer Palace. Most of that was actually rebuilt for funds that were supposed to be used in the military, um, but, but were moved elsewhere. Um, you know, it, it's, it's reason based. It's actually it's not outside sources um, that cause things like um, by the Boxer Rebellion, by the crucifixion of Monoseki. It's a hundred years of corruption, of mismanagement um, that, that ultimately ended imperial China and, and left China in total oblivion. They've never seen um, more humiliation, arguably, than, than they did at the end of the Qing dynasty. And it, it wasn't short, it was a hundred years. So I just wanted to pick up on that point that you suggested it was external factors. I just don't think that's possible. I think it came just from them. I think there's always going to be apologies for imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't disagree that there were not significant internal problems going on in the Qing dynasty at the end of the empire. But you to ignore the incredible pressures of first one wave and then a subsequent, at the end of the 19th century, even more aggressive way, wave of imperialist aggression and colonialist competition around the world, not just in China, uh, I think is to ignore a really important part of not just Chinese history, but global history. So I don't dispute your original point that there were certainly internal problems, and the 100 Days reforms were a missed opportunity, I will agree. But I'm sorry, I've got to just simply say that as someone who studies imperialism as an as a academic subject, you can't possibly ignore or discount the extraordinary pressures that China, India, parts of Africa, most of, Latin, most of the global south for that matter, was facing at the time. I, I disagree slightly with Brother Jeremiah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but m it's a question of interpretation. I think what you raise is a very valid point, and that the corruption and eventual decline of the Qing had its seeds planted in the late 18th century because of Qianlong's expansion, because of the corruption that came about. But I think it is important to bear that imp interpretation of the past along with what Jeremiah has said and to view this as the overarching question was the extraordinary challenge facing the Qing court because they were dealing with the challenge of having to go from their state as a civilization to a nation state, a concept which they didn't understand and which had only recently arisen within Europe and North America and elsewhere. So th that they were facing a series of, of s extreme issues externally, internally, for which the old rules no longer apply. <coughs> And I, I'm, I see corruption and ineptitude there, but I also see uh, a fierce aggression that was exerted by the outside world. Not uniformly. Surely the, the, the founder of the precursor of Peking University was a Scotsman named William Martin, right? So it, it's one can't really sort of engage in the sort of Edward Said notion that everyone was working as a conspiracy theorist for empire. Uh, but you know, the challenge was what, how do we move into a new world where we don't understand the rules of the road, which is why it wound up failing spectacularly. I have one more question. May, may I? Oh, may oh, yeah. Can, uh, uh, just one more point. Yes, I agree with uh, what the esteemed colleagues from the Qin Dynasty said. Uh, this is, was a very difficult time, and uh, you know, it's easy to judge the Qin Dynasty from uh, our vantage point now, 200 years later almost. But also, let's look at it. I mean, the Qing dynasty, unlike the Ming dynasty, had more opportunities to wake up to the future world than the Ming time. 
they had the first opium war in 1841, the second uh, opium war in 1864, then they had the, the Taiping Rebellion, which was also inspired by the West because uh, the, the leader thought he was the younger brother of Jesus, not Jesus himself. Um, <laughs> and uh, there was the Zheng Guofang, the guy who cracked down on the Taiping and said we, we have to reform. They didn't reform. And then there was a hundred uh, days uh, uh, attempt reform during Emperor Guangxu. So we have several, several attempts over a period of 60, 70 years, and nothing, nothing happened, nothing happened. Unlike with Japan, which woke up the first time when uh, Commodore Percy bombarded uh, Tokyo Harbor, and then they woke up and said, we have to reform one time, and that was it. Uh, and they did it, so it meant it was possible the Qing took 70 years and did nothing. So, no, I'll just say uh, one quick thing. Uh, it reminds me of a slogan today that people use, cultural self-confidence. And I think to have one Zixin, it helps if you're running your own country, if you're masters in your own house. I think the Qing always sort of felt themselves as neither here nor there and maybe not able to challenge the system because it wasn't their system. They were fantastic chameleons who could do this, they could do that, but they could never really, they were not Chinese, and I don't think they felt comfortable to do the kinds of changes that like the Japanese did. So it wasn't like nobody could, could change, but China didn't, and it was, and of course it's a tragedy, and these kind of changes were far more than anyone else faced. So not trying to minimize that at all, but. I dissent from my colleagues here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, we'll be very quickly. Uh, think of the word for country in Chinese. Think of the word for democracy. Think of the word for capitalism. Who invented those words? The Japanese. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and think why, in terms of adaption of foreign ideas, the Japanese were superb at that. Whereas I was quote quoting this one Islamic scholar who took Islamic words and translated them into classical Chinese. They didn't use any sort of phonetics. Allah did not become Allah. It became the heavenly master and on Imam. So that was one of the challenges for the Qing because it took them for years to begin to understand what the hell these guys were talking about. <laughs> In much the same way that many <laughs> Asian countries took a long time to try to figure out what the hell are they talking about when they go on Imam about human rights? What does that mean? Thank you. Next question. Um, give me the long question, Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if both sides could comment on the m unique military innovations from both dynasties. Yes. yes. Actually, they were brought by the Jesuits. <laughs> 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 they built the cannons that uh, defeated uh, the Ming dynasty, I must say. Because, um, yes, they invented, um, the, the Chinese invented the gunpowder, but the gun, the steel, the technology of steel came uh, from the West and the Jesuits brought in, both to Japan and uh, to China. So, here you are. <laughs> you know, in the, at during the time of the Opium War, where where, Eng where Great Britain was enjoying the fruits of uh, having a head start in the Industrial Revolution. They brought ships and guns to the China coast that were very difficult for the Qing defenses to deal with. But one of the things that the British found when they actually seized Nanjing was an almost complete uh, replica of one of their steamships that had been reverse engineered by the, en by the Chinese and were almost getting ready to try to launch on their own. You know, you're right that in the 19th century, it was very difficult for China to reform, the Qing Empire to reform. Comparing to Japan isn't terribly fair. Ch the Qing was a giant multicultural empire. Japan was a very different kind of place. Moreover, I do think there were many attempts to try to reform at that time. There were arsenals, there were shipyards, there was all these kind of efforts to make, to improve the military technology in order to kind of level the playing field between the aggressors and the, the homeland. But at the same time, uh, 
the situation was such that military technology was progressing so quickly in the rest of the world, in large part due to the ongoing wars of colonialism, that it was very tough for any of the non-European or European you know, um, satellite states to play keep up. Although I have to say that Song Guofan, Li Hongzhang, and there they did as best they could given the limitations that they had and given the pressures that they faced. And they did it without Jesuit help. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right. But if I may, just say a, f a footnote. Technology, weapons, fine. But uh, the Chinese had better weapons facing the Japanese uh, in the naval battle, or I forget the... Shimonoseki. Shimonoseki in 1888. But three, sorry, the Battle of Yalu River. And, uh, but they didn't have a Western-style command system. The Japanese had the lesser weapons, but had uh, a good uh, Western-style command sy system, and they won. So that means, yes, technology, but no, they didn't understand the philosophy behind that. And that was really what was dragging behind, and uh, as uh, my brother in arms here said, Maybe this is uh, what was really about. The, they didn't get the essence of the change. Well, that's a very interesting conclusion, and no definitive. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all very much. Now, we have a great moment of applause. Have our wonderful debater changed your mind? So, to remind you, the proposition was which is better, the, the Ming or the Qing? The proposition is that the Ming was better than the Qing. And it doesn't answer the question. What does it mean by better? I was brought up in a history book called 1066 and all that. Where the good things happened to me. That was a good thing. And so that was my conduct as president. <laughs> <laughs> so, hands up please for those who support the proposition that the Ming was better than the Qing dynasty. Too many units on their side. <laughs> Could probably just do it by show of hands. I mean, you know. And Ian, now Ian Johnson will hang himself on the roof. <laughs> and he's just looking for a unit to help him. <laughs> uh, but that's, so that's the end of, of our event today. The speakers, of course, are all going to be hanging around the bar, and hopefully a lot of you will, will join them. Um, as David said, uh, we, the Royal Asiatic Society, have worked at the Bookworm for a long time. This is our 25th event uh, in conjunction with the Bookworm and our 123rd event altogether. And we're determined that the Book Club and the Royal Asiatic Society are going to continue to collaborate in whatever form it takes. Uh, the very next event we're having is going to be held, a joint event between the Book Club and the Royal Asiatic Society, very generously hosted by the Oxford House Hotel. And to bring things right up to date, it's going to be asking the question, can China embarrass the world? Have green growth. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> so that, that's on November the 26th, over the date. And I invite a lot of you who are lovely new faces to me, please to check up our uh, events on our website, on our WeChat site, and indeed perhaps become members. So meanwhile, thank you all very much indeed for coming to a wonderful evening. Thank you.